All right, we're going to talk about pulmonary edema first, um, and then we'll talk about respiratory failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, and that's it for this video. But, okay, so pulmonary edema. This is an emergency situation. You have to treat it rapidly once you recognize signs and symptoms of pulmonary edema. How this happens is whenever there is too much fluid um, in the blood volume for your body to be able to handle it, okay? So whenever you have too much blood volume pumped through the right side of the heart into the lungs, those capillaries can't handle that much fluid, and so it starts seeping into the alveoli, which then eventually basically you're going to end up drowning yourself from within because of the excess amount of blood volume. So you're going to start seeing some signs and symptoms like dyspnea, breathlessness, um, feelings of suffocation, cool, moist, cyanotic extremities, gray color to the skin, and a continuous cough. Usually you're going to see some blood tinged frothy sputum. Um, it, they really feel like they're drowning in just in normal dry ground. It's very frightening. Here's your mnemonic device for pulmonary edema. Um, this is how we treat it. We give them morphine, um, aminophylline, digitalis, diuretics, oxygen, and we check their ABGs regularly. Okay, respiratory failure. This is the inability of your lungs to actually um, be able to exchange gases, the CO2 and O2, um, for the body's needs. You're not able to do that sufficiently. Um, it can be acute or chronic. Um, acute occurs suddenly with um, previous normal lung function. All of a sudden, your lungs are not transmitting gases the way they need to. In chronic, there's some progressive loss of function, like with COPD or something, and it's usually irreversible. Um, ventilation failure develops if the alveoli just can't expand enough um, or can't transmit the gases well enough, or if you have a neurological dysfunction where your control of your respirations is just significantly impaired. Something's wrong in your brain and it's not telling your body to breathe. Um, or it could be caused from a traumatic injury that occurs to your chest wall, just making it um, impossible for your lungs to actually keep up with the demands of oxygenation and releasing the CO2. The signs and symptoms you're going to see um, with chronic, it's typically not apparent because this, the progression of it is pretty slow, but with acute, you're going to notice some apprehension like, like, like oh, I, I'm in trouble breathing, and then some restlessness, fatigue, um, a headache, trouble breathing, pain with the bre breathing, wheezing, cyanosis, accessory muscles involved with the breathing. Um, if it goes untreated, eventually the patient is going to become confused, tachycardic, um, have severe hypotension, um, congestive heart failure, respiratory acidosis, and go into a respiratory arrest. Um, to diagnose it, we want to get ABGs. And what we're going to see is a PaO2 less than 50, a PaCO2 greater than 50, and a pH less than 7.25. So they're very acidotic, they have very low O2 levels and very high CO2 levels. Um, to treat it, we want to maintain an airway as much as possible. We're probably going to end up doing um, an endotracheal tube, which we have to intubate using the endotracheal tube, or they might end up having to do a tracheostomy where they directly access the trachea. Um, we are going to hyperoxygenate them with a venturi mask um, and then figure out what the underlying cause is and treat that rapidly. As a nurse, we need to be able to recognize if a patient is in respiratory failure and we want to get a crash cart immediately. This is the um, equivalent of a patient going into cardiac arrest, okay, except on the respiratory side of things. I'm going to call a doctor immediately. I'm going to assess their respiratory rates and depth, um, look at their O2 saturations um, and all of their vital signs. We want to relieve anxiety as much as possible, stay calm, and just get everything done fast, 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 okay? Um, get ABGs quickly um, so that we can determine where the patient is at in um, respiratory status. Okay, acute respiratory distress synd syndrome. You also will hear it called ARDS or ARDS. Um, it occurs with other clinical conditions, typically things like um, aspiration, pneumonia, or um, near drowning, or if they have um, aspirated on their vomit for some reason. It also can occur in DIC, and I don't think y'all have really learned about DIC yet, but the fast and dirty way to explain that is it's a condition where there are way too many tiny little clots all throughout the vasculature. It's an emergent um, and critical condition, and typically patients are going to be in ICU if they've been diagnosed with DIC, okay? It stands for Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation. 
Um, it also can occur after massive transfusions of blood um, or after direct damage to the lungs because of smoke inhalation uh, with a fire, um, following shock or trauma of any kind, um, any major surgery, a pulmonary embolism, or septicemia, which is um, systemic infections um, all throughout your blood flow. Um, the mortality rate with ARDS is really high, um, especially whenever the underlying cause can't be treated quickly. The body is going to respond to the injury just by decreasing its blood flow to the lungs, um, and eventually that's going to start causing the platelets to clump together. The platelets then release histamine um, or bradykinin and serotonin, and all of those cause in the inflammatory response of the alveolar membrane. Okay, so whenever that happens in the alveoli, they become really inflamed. Um, it increases their permeability, and you can't actually um, transmit the gases the way that you need to. Um, fluids are going to enter the alveoli, and eventually you're going to see some pulmonary edema, which if we remember correctly, that is an emergency. Um, that's going to eventually cause atelectasis, which is lung collapse, um, and that definitely decreases your gas exchange as well. The lungs become really stiff and non-compliant, and the patient ends, in, ends up having hypoxemia or hypercapnia, okay? And that means um, low oxygen levels and high CO2 levels. Um, the respiratory distress usually develops within about 8 to 48 hours, which is kind of a long time um, to have to like sit and wait and see what's happening. But that's after the onset of the illness or injury or whatever is causing this. Um, as it progresses, what you're going to start seeing in the signs and symptoms is an increased respiratory rate that's really shallow, really labored, and you're going to be seeing the accessory muscles used. You also are going to start noticing some cyanosis of their, uh, typically under their nail beds and on their lips. Um, and a lot of times that cyanosis and restlessness and increased respiratory rate are not relieved by supplemental oxygen. Um, and so that's something that starts to kind of worry us. You're going to start seeing some increased agitation and anxiety in the patient as well. Very, very restless. Um, they are going to start becoming confused because of the decreased levels of oxygen that's getting to their brain. Um, and then drowsiness with some, um, you know, decreased oxygenation levels to their brain. Um, diagnostic tests are just based on evidence of um, acute respiratory failure or um, if we notice bilateral infiltrates, which means um, the aspiration of something infiltrating um, the lungs on the chest x-ray. Um, hypoxemia is a term that is describing low levels of oxygenation in the blood. Um, and when we do the ABGs, we're going to notice a PaO2 less than 50, which is a really low levels of oxygen with supplemental um, oxygen of 50 to 60% on a venti mask. So this patient is already receiving a lot of supplemental oxygen and their PaO2 is still below 50. Um, you're not going to really notice any evidence of left-sided heart failure in this um, condition. To treat it, we want to figure out what the initial cause is, diagnose it, and treat it quickly. We want to maintain their airway as much as possible through an ET tube or a tracheostomy. Um, we want to probably put these patients on mechanical ventilation. Like I said, they're probably going to be in the ICU, and they're probably going to have a swan scans catheter. And if you remember what that is, we've talked about it briefly before, and that's where they can um, really monitor their um, vital signs and their um, ABGs regularly through that swan scan. Um, although the pulmonary edema is going to be present, the rest of their circulatory system is hypovolemic. So all that fluid is really entering the lung tissue and it's not usable fluid throughout the circulatory system. Um, let's see. Uh, skip that. Um, we want to make sure that they have plenty of nutrition. Um, NG tubes or TPN are usually used um, to help um, keep up their nutritional status. We'll be back to talk about lung cancer here in a little while, um, but I will talk to you soon.